All right. <laughs> Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Leaders in Housing Counseling webinar. Today is Thursday, May 19th, 2022. Uh, my name is Ebony. I am the Administrative Manager here at National Housing Resource Center, and I'll be your navigator for the day. Uh, before we get started, I do have a couple of items that I want to go over with you. Um, and since you are on our webinar, we would love to hear where each of you are watching from. Um, if you could just put your name, well, your city and state and what organization you belong to, that would be greatly appreciated. The closed captioning for this webinar has been enabled. If you are unable to view the closed captioning, we ask that you toggle your mouse at the bottom of the screen um, and click the closed captioning button. Um, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, we ask that you put them in the questions box and not in the chat box. Again, all questions should be uh, asked in the questions box and not the chat box. Also, uh, any links that we have or any of our presenters have for this webinar will be added to the chat box throughout this presentation. There will also be a link added for our PowerPoint presentation if you would like to click on that in order to follow along in our webinar. So that's all that I have for you. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce Dor Palin and he is going to take it from here. There you go, Bruce. Thank you so much, Ebony. Um, we are uh, um, really pleased to have you here. Um, and let me just do a quick review of what we're gonna do for the, uh, for the call today. Um, uh, we're gonna start out by um, really talking a little bit about Buffalo um, and the shootings, the killings that happened there. Um, it's difficult and um, frustrating and um, we felt like important to both acknowledge and to um, uh, give some chance some space for people to say things if they felt like it um, and uh, please put those in the uh, in the chat box so others can see as well and um, we were going to acknowledge the um, what happened um, to the individuals in in uh, Buffalo and then also um, we have the privilege of David Young who you probably know quite well now from Housing Action Illinois um, is from Buffalo and can really give some context and, um, and helpful thoughts on all this. Uh, so um, we'll spend the first uh, uh, few minutes of the call on, on that. And then um, we'll do NHRC updates. Um, uh, Christy is um, getting her, um, graduating with her master's degree at Johns Hopkins today. And so I'll cover as best I can on the legislative things, but some, some progress um, on our work there. Thanks for everybody's participation on that. And uh, we also had a big breakthrough with FHFA on the data fields and language preference. Um, Ellie will do some updates as well. Um, on the work that she's doing. Uh, the bulk of the call will be around uh, the role of um, private equity of corporate um, uh, entities coming in and buying large parts of the housing market. Um, and we have da David Sanchez to give a, a big overview of this, especially in the home ownership market. Um, and I'm really pleased to say we have Andrew Park and I think we also have Ricardo Valadez from um, um, Americans for Financial Reform to talk with us about um, a report that they're about to release about the um, private equity purchasing of, of housing stock, uh, single family and multifamily um, and uh, that the impact. And then I'm also very pleased to say um, we have Sandra Lees from MH Action and she's a resident of a mobile home park. And I believe that she's in a mobile home park that has been purchased by a private equity firm and is able to talk a little bit about what that, what the impact is on this and on, on people who are living there and a direct um, lived experience. Um, and uh, mobile homes are, or manufactured homes, excuse me, Manufactured homes are really the um, um, one of the true affordable housing opportunities that are still out there uh, for many people, and um, uh, this has a big impact on affordability. 
Um, we'll have some room for question and answer. And I expect the call will go after longer than the usual hour and a half, depending on, on how much um, uh, people want to ask questions. So think about it as, as potentially going as much as two hours if, if the demand is there and we'll, we'll stay for all of that. So with that quick note, let's move on to um, our response to the Buffalo, New York and the shootings that happened there. Um, and uh, I, I think um, in, in some ways, one of the difficulties of all of this is that we, um, um, there's just both a sense of horror and a sense of helplessness about events like this. Um, and it's important for us to both acknowledge that and also to try to bring to the fore um, whatever resources and opportunities people have. And we're also hoping to just at least mention that the kind of work that we do intersects with um, what helps mitigate and um, um, prevent things like this happening uh, and, and how, how we fit into that um, uh, in, in a way that's maybe not as obvious as, as um, other roles. So um, uh, let's start out. Um, we thought it's very important to acknowledge um, the, the good people that um, were um, senselessly killed. And I'm gonna hand it over to Ebony to take that part. Thank you, Bruce. So we just wanna uh, read the names of the people who lost uh, their lives prematurely uh, during that uh, Buffalo tragedy. So it's Roberta A. Drury, Margus D. Morrison, Andre McNeil, Aaron Salter, Geraldine Talley, Celestine Cheney, Hayward Patterson, Catherine Massey, Pearl Young, and Ruth Whitfield. Thank you, Ebony, um, and um, we will um, keep in our minds and thoughts um, um, these people uh, and the damage that's been done here. Um, we also have the privilege of uh, David Young um, from Housing Action Illinois, who has often been on these calls and um, been deeply active in housing in, in um, both um, uh, Illinois and um, nationally. Um, come from Buffalo. And um, so we'd like David to give some of his insight into um, um, Buffalo and um, so how, how he thinks about all of this. David, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, as Bruce mentioned, I have um, often spoken uh, to the uh, leaders about various housing issues. And um, this is one time where I actually wish that uh, I did not uh, have to speak to the group uh, about this. Um, but as Bruce said, I am from Buffalo, uh, although um, uh, my uh, both sets of grandparents uh, migrated to Buffalo, um, uh, one set from Arkansas, another set from Tennessee. Uh, my parents were uh, born uh, in Buffalo um, and my mother was raised in the uh, 14208 zip code. And although my brother and I uh, were raised in the suburbs uh, because my grandparents lived in the 14208 zip code, I spent a lot of time in that area. Uh, and I also started my career um, in, um, uh, I started my career uh, in Buffalo, uh, started my career in housing in Buffalo and lived in the 14208 zip code until I uh, left Buffalo in 2003. So I am very familiar with the area, uh, have continued to go back to visit family. Uh, I know exactly where that grocery store is. I shopped at that grocery store uh, after it was constructed because it was uh, very close to uh, where I lived. Um, one of the things that um, 
uh, I find um, very disheartening uh, about all of this is um, that a uh, lot, like a lot of areas, uh, uh, a lot of minority communities across the country, uh, the 14208 zip code uh, has seen a significant amount of disinvestment. Um, uh, as you drive through the neighborhood now, there are uh, lots of uh, vacant lots where houses and families used to be. Uh, there are boarded up um, storefronts where businesses used to thrive. Uh, it was a place where uh, when my parents were younger, uh, you could find anything uh, that you were looking for uh, within that area. Um, and over the years, um, the disinvestment has been stark. And that's why that grocery store uh, uh, was so important, um, is so important to the community. So there have been a lot of policies um, related to this disinvestment, uh, everything from urban renewal uh, to highway construction um, that have impacted um, this community. Um, the 14208 zip code um, uh, the majority of the residents are, are Black. Uh, the housing values in the 14208 zip code uh, are about uh, $50,000, uh, so significantly less than other communities um, in Western New York. The household income in the neighborhood is about $33,000, significantly less than other areas of the community. And Buffalo uh, is one of the most segregated uh, communities in the United States. It also has some of the oldest housing stock in the United States. And because of all of these things, uh, this individual decided that this was the place to strike uh, in order to um, uh, try and accelerate, uh, as the theory is, uh, as the theory goes, um, uh, some type of, of war, uh, and we cannot stand for that. I think it's really important uh, for us to understand, one, what led uh, to what happened on Saturday, uh, but also think about how we can work uh, to make sure that these things don't happen again. We like to sometimes think that when uh, something like this happens, that it's an anomaly, that it was rare, um, that it was a fringe uh, person, and that um, uh, these things don't happen regularly. But one of the things that we learned uh, yesterday or earlier today was that uh, this individual actually had a video conference with several people uh, before carrying out this vicious act, which means that there are um, opportunities for more things like this to happen in other communities across the country. And we must stand up uh, both in our industry as well as, in, as individuals uh, in order to thwart this type of activity. This is not the America that we stand for. This is not the America uh, that uh, we so value. Um, and so it is very important for us to work uh, to make sure that these things do not happen. Now, there are a lot of questions about what the housing counseling industry can do. What is our role? Is there something special that we should be doing? And I don't necessarily have the answer to that. But what I do know is that our work of helping people to find suitable housing, whether it's rental or home ownership, is so very important. And we must redouble our efforts to continue doing it. Each one of us on this call has had an impact on somebody's life. We've helped them to secure a safe and affordable apartment. We've helped them to start building wealth through home ownership. And the more that we can do that for people, the better off we all are. 
On the policy front, we must continue to work to uh, encourage policies uh, that make for a better country. We cannot have policies that serve um, some and not the many. We must have policies that serve everyone in this country. I think the last thing that I would want to say about this is when some tragedy like this happens, whether it's in Buffalo or it's in Pittsburgh or it's in El Paso or Atlanta, we tend to be very upset, but with the news cycle, we move on to something else. It is important for all of us to keep what happened in Buffalo and in Pittsburgh and in Atlanta and El Paso in the front of our minds and to think about what we can do and advocate for what our representatives at all levels of government can do to make sure that policies are better and that activities like this stop. Whether you are black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whoever you are, in whatever neighborhood you live in, you deserve the right to be able to shop and go to school and walk around without worrying if your life is at risk. And as housing counselors, we can continue to make that message heard. So I thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, I hope that my words have been somewhat helpful and um, you are certainly welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts. And again, thank you to Bruce and NHRC for the opportunity to comment this afternoon. Thank you so much, David. Um, kind of a difficult conversation, but um, I do think that uh, part of this is for us to recognize um, the value of ourselves as a, uh, as a community um, of people who are really working on building um, community and safety and, and security. And um, that this, um, this kind of event, we, I mean, I, we do need to figure out how not to forget, but also um, how to build. And um, I think part of all of our work is, is around that. And um, I'm actually pleased to say that the guests that we've got today are part of that effort as well. Um, and um, I'll look forward to looking at what people have to say in the chat. Um, and uh, I mean, I have to say that, that these kind of conversations have been helpful to me as well. So um, let's move on and um, let's, let's talk about um, things that we're working on that are part of the bigger picture. Um, so uh, as I said earlier, Christy is not able to join us today because she's graduating, uh, getting her master's at, at Johns Hopkins in, in urban planning. And so um, I'm gonna cover her base for her, but she's doing great work out there in the field. So, um, uh, and, uh, and she'll reach out to uh, many of your offices at different times when we're doing legislative meetings with um, um, people that um, uh, represent your district. And, and so please be responsive to that, it really helps. Okay, so $100 million for um, FY 2023 appropriations. That's our push. Um, we obviously didn't make it across the finish line last year, but um, we are redoubling our effort. So the good news is we put together the, um, the letter, um, our sign -on, annual sign-on letter and 145 housing counseling agencies. And I'm pretty sure we have every state covered there um, and uh, many of the states really well represented. Um, so that helps a lot, um, and it's a tool we will use when we do um, the meetings. This went out to every House and Senate office, and it goes to the, the um, um, all, all the electeds, but really to their legislative director and to their housing policy team. Um, we um, also, the 
it, internally to the House and in the Senate, they have a dear colleague letter, which is a way of indicating that there's strong support among um, uh, some part of the House and Senate. And um, so in the Senate, uh, we got 38 signatures, um, which is a very good number. Um, uh, they're all Democrats and we have, um, and there are 50 Democrats, so we got pretty close. Um, Senator Manchin signed. It's a broad range of progressive, moderate, and um, uh, senators. Um, and then on 100, we had 117 House members sign uh, the Dear Colleague for the appropriators, um, and that was a, that broke our record. Um, and uh, so that's that was really good news. I want to thank um, all of you that participated. Also acknowledge uh, the work of Andy Gucek at the Cal Coalition for uh, Intermediaries and uh, working for Green Path and, and HPF, um, who, who coordinated with us on these. So on a different topic, um, we um, had a really big win um, a week ago, and that is Sandra Thompson, the acting director at FHFA, um, has set up a new policy requiring that our housing counseling data fields and language preference will be required on all Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac mortgages. Um, and this is really a big deal. We've been working on this since 2013. Um, and um, that's when um, close to when NHRC had just started and um, among our early meetings. And we really started to work on how do we build housing counseling and integrate it into the uh, um, into the uh, electronic communication system that uh, exists in um, uh, for the um, uh, for the lenders, uh, and we the the big push had been to get it into the uniform residential loan application. I'm sure many of you know we talked endlessly about this, and many of you lobbied on this. Um, and it was important to get our housing counseling data fields, but also to get language preference um, in the foreclosure crisis. And we again see it today. There have been big problems because um, communications are in English and where English is not your um, native language or the language you're most familiar in, that really puts you at a disadvantage. And during the foreclosure crisis, people just lost opportunities. They missed deadlines. Um, they saw, didn't always understand an offer was being provided to them that might've been quite advantageous. Um, and the, um, uh, the servicers were just not communicating in. So we'll do more work on this in the implementation. Um, it's actually rolled out, so it will be in place by March, 2023. Um, and we will work on integrating the, the data fields and the language preference and the work that we're doing that, that David and, um, and others are working on in the tech field to uh, uh, get it integrated into MISMO. There's a lot of good things that will flow from this. So, Want to acknowledge that um, as a as a as a big win that you know hey it just took nine years to get there that's all so um, thanks for hanging tight on some of these things good well let's move on to Ellie and um, uh, the NHRC updates that she has thanks Bruce and hi everybody uh, so just a few things really quickly uh, the homeowner assistance fund updates there. Uh, is new reporting guidance that they just put out on May 11th. The link there will take you to a page of all of the documents that are related to reporting. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see the reporting guidance that was issued in May. Um, the, uh, the advocates are still kind of reviewing it and going through it uh, to see uh, if, if everything seems to be in there okay. But uh, one of the things that you should know on a monthly basis, we have a regular call for uh, the state, the half state advocates. And if you'd like to be part of that call and attend it, um, the next one is next week, actually, just send me an email. There's also a listserv that you could be part of to get emails that are specific to half updates and things that are going on in half. And again, just send, send me an email and I will, uh, I'll get you added and I'll, I'll get the calendar invite to you for the monthly meetings. Uh, some very exciting news. We have new escalation contacts available. The CFPB has actually been working really hard to get uh, contacts at places that we have not had in the past. Uh, so these are some of the newest ones that we just received, Arvest, Bay, Midfirst, and Quicken. 
Um, the, I have added those to our list, but it has not been updated on our website yet because CFPB is actually continuing to send me more. So uh, keep looking and going to our website and clicking into the link. Uh, if you uh, click into the link and you need a password and you don't have it, you can just email me and I will send you the super secret password as long as you are a HUD approved organization and you are a housing counselor at a HUD approved organization. Uh, and, and again, more will be coming. So you'll want to check it on a pretty regular basis. Um, but what is in there right now is a new escalation contact for SPS, which I know a lot of people were looking for. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, so take a look at it. And then I can't go without mentioning our National Housing Resource Center job board, where you can post your housing counseling uh, program jobs. It doesn't have to be just your housing counselor jobs. It can also be your housing counseling intake coordinator, your any of your support folks that are in your housing counseling program, your program directors, any of those kinds of positions you can post here. And you should also uh, know to post, uh, uh, look for resumes that are posted. There may be some folks that have already posted resumes. Uh, the last I looked, there were 17 resumes in the system. They may be people that you're looking for. Uh, so be sure that you look at the resumes and um, feel free to post your resume and tell your family and your friends about the opportunity to post your resume there. Uh, with that, I think we can go ahead and move on to the uh, meat of our presentation. And Bruce, did you want to do some introductions? Let's do it. So um, I think all of us are pretty familiar now with the fact that private equity companies are purchasing houses that are traditionally single family houses that uh, might be starter houses or affordable houses that um, uh, families buy their, use as their first house and that that housing stock is being depleted very rapidly and the competition for those houses um, has gotten to be pretty extreme um, in many, many communities. The, um, uh, we've been working on this as you know and we've shared some of the materials, but we wanna take a step back and ask um, experts who are looking at this and looking at it um, in, in many of its different aspects, how it impacts single family home ownership, single family rental, uh, multifamily apartments, and um, um, manufactured home and manufactured home parks. So we're gonna to try to touch on all of these today. Um, and we're gonna start with uh, um, David Sanchez with NCST with the National Community Stabilization Trust. Um, NCST has had a leading role in addressing policy issues around, originally around um, vacant houses and, and trying to secure title to bring them back into the affordable housing uh, marketplace. Um, they're a valuable organization. Up until very recently, um, the head of NCST was uh, Julia Gordon, who um, has been on our calls several times and um, is now good news, head of FHFA as an FHA commissioner. Um, she just uh, got voted in in the Senate uh, on uh, Tuesday and um, we've heard that she's already at her desk working. So that's really good news. Um, and, uh, um, but we will continue working with NCST and, and David um, who's been a very good ally and has helped us in, in doing the brief on um, uh, private equity um, issues, as well as many other things. So David, thank you for joining us and let me hand it over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you, Bruce, um, and the rest of NHRC. Um, and also, thanks for everyone for being here today. Um, as Bruce mentioned, my name is David Sanchez. I am the Director of Research and Development um, at NCST. Um, and, you know, NCST, as Bruce alluded to, um, is a national nonprofit um, and you know, essentially, uh, you know, we are an organization that focuses on um, sustainable and affordable home ownership, uh, both as a, you know, as a pathway to stabilizing and strengthening communities, um, and also to, um, you know, promoting wealth of low and moderate income households and, and closing the racial wealth gap. So um, we do a couple of different things. Um, you know, as as Bruce alluded to, um, 
we were formed after the foreclosure crisis. Um, and, um, and one of the things that we were set up to do and that we continue to do today is that we run a network um, that uh, where we vet and approve nonprofits and government entities um, so that they have a, an exclusive opportunity to purchase um, certain distressed properties. So, you know, we are a source of foreclosure distressed properties uh, to community partners across the country uh, who rehabilitate those homes and put them back into productive use as home ownership or affordable rental opportunities. Um, the other thing we do is uh, we are a research and policy organization primarily focused on national policy, um, a bit of state policy too, specifically having to do uh, with uh, mortgage origination, mortgage servicing, um, the uh, you know the various HUD subsidy programs that could be used for affordable home ownership, um, and um, and yeah, and the distressed properties market space. So um, so that gives you a bit of the background. Um, I've had the joy of working with Bruce and Ellie for a few years now on federal policy, and um, got to work with them last year to put out, as Bruce referenced. Um, a, an NHRC uh, report or issue brief on this topic of um, the corporatization of housing or, um, you know, cash or investor buyers beating out first time home buyers or owner occupants in today's housing market. So um, I'm going to spend the, the bulk of my time today talking about, uh, you know, essentially uh, the landscape that we're facing today and um, what it is, what are some of the tools that um, that we have to deal with them to really prioritize owner occupancy and first time buyers in our market instead of um, corporate investors. Um, so, uh, you know, so speaking about the background, you know, there is a lot of data out there about, uh, you know, how many homes are being bought by investors. And that can mean a couple of different, you know, couple of different entities. Um, it could mean, um, you know, kind of more mom and pop landlords. It could mean medium scale organizations. It could be large scale private equity or institutional investors. Um, AFR in a little bit is going to present some new research on that private equity piece in particular, and there are a couple um, particulars, uh, uh, I think specifically about the role that private equity plays in the market that we should all pay attention to. Uh, but that being said, private equity is one of many buyers in our housing market, and um, they have you know, come to be a larger and larger role. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, I think Looking back at the housing market since the foreclosure crisis, you know, one could argue, and many do, that investors played a really valuable role in putting a floor on home prices when we had an oversupply, um, you know, creating demand for these homes, creating someone who was willing to purchase them so that home prices could stop falling. Um, we are now in a completely different environment. We are in a nationwide supply shortage. Um, and while that supply shortage has been developing over the past um, you know, 10 to 15 years across the country. We're now in the case where it almost feels like we have a supply shortage in every neighborhood in the country. And I'm, I think I'm only slightly exaggerating what I ask when I say that. So we are seeing high demand and rising prices for for sale homes in nearly all, all locations during the these past two years of the pandemic. Um, and demand is coming from many different parties, including both institutional investors and private equity, uh, as well as, uh, you know, wealthier households who are able to pay with cash, people looking for second homes, um, and, uh, and, and then also, you know, sort of the first time home buyers that we seek to prioritize or, um, or, or somehow, um, you know, encourage in, in part of our neighborhood stabilization um, programs. So uh, a couple other things that we are seeing in the market right now is that um, sellers of homes or their, or their real estate agents will sometimes or often disfavor offers um, or bids placed on homes that rely on FHA VA or USDA financing, um, or those offers that have uh, down payment assistance, or even sometimes offers that have just traditional um, contingencies. And, and this is just a reflection of um, how much competition is out there for homes. And, uh, you know, as they, as they sometimes say, you know, cash is king. Um, as, as a seller or as an agent, um, there are legitimate reasons why you would prefer an, uh, an offer that is certain and does not rely on mortgage financing or other financing institutions to come through. However, that practice greatly places owner occupants and first time home buyers at disadvantage, especially lower moderate income households. Um, a couple of the other challenges that we're seeing, um, you know, one of the reasons why it's difficult uh, to buy some of the lower priced homes actually in this country is actually um, that they're, um, it's, it's pretty difficult uh, to get um, low balance mortgage originated um, and oftentimes, you know, under 100,000 or under 75,000 
dollar purchase price, um, you, you might not be able to find a mortgage originator that views it as profitable or as um, really all that high of a priority to be originating a mortgage loan with that balance. So um, that is a challenge in the access to credit space. Um, I, you know, my organization focused specifically on distressed properties in, in our programming. So we always like to point out that there are a large number of property sales where, um, you know, in, owner occupants never really get to come to the table. Um, in fact, these are sales processes that are built to, um, to get homes to more sophisticated investors, um, sometimes for good reasons, because they have more capacity to fix them up or, uh, you know, take on a risk with the property, but also for, um, you know, has the effect of restricting the supply of affordable housing that's available for owner occupants. Um, and, you know, as a culmination of all of these trends, uh, I guess we would say that, you know, this is putting affordable and sustainable home ownership at risk at a time when it should be a key strategy for closing the racial wealth gap. And that's really the kind of the, the core message that we, um, we came together and coalesced around when the National Housing Resource Assessor Center was organizing um, our conversations on this topic last summer. So, um, Ebony, do you mind going to the next slide? Uh, excellent. So um, I'm going to spend the remainder of my time talking about, you know, what can we do about this problem? What can we do to counter, uh, you know, what might call excessive demand from institutional or cash investors um, and prioritize first-time homebuyers and owner occupants? Uh, so the first bucket of, of um, policies I want to talk about is uh, federal, federal policies, specifically those that are administrative or regulatory. Uh, the first one is protecting home buyers that use government-backed financing. Um, and, that, and what that means is um, looking at requirements that um, are imposed by FHA, VA, or USDA um, that you know, make it harder to close these loans or slower to close these loans. That essentially means uh, that savers disfavor these offers in a competitive home sale environment. Um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's also worth uh, examining the practice of the agents and sellers who um, are the ones disfavoring these offers um, in the first place. But um, I do think that FHA and the other federal agencies can take actions that would uh, streamline the programs and, and um, manage risk in a way that would, um, you know, essentially make these, these sources of financing more competitive. Um, we, the, uh, the second one is to improve existing federal programs so that they better support affordable home ownership. Um, we've seen actually some really exciting announcements on this topic. Recently, the White House has announced um, that it's going to be looking at the home regulations, um, as well as um, mentioned kind of uh, looking at the CDBG regulations. These are two of the biggest subsidy programs that come out of HUD that are granted. Uh, to states and localities, um, and we are going to be looking and advocating for opportunities to uh, ensure that these are the best, these are efficient tools really to support um, home ownership as well as rental housing. Um, uh, third is to increase the sales of federally backed distressed properties uh, to nonprofit or mission minded developers. Um, this is a, you know, a core NCST focus and uh, fortunately, um, we also saw some exciting news come out of the Biden administration earlier this month that they are going to be uh, selling a greater share of FHA-backed properties that go through foreclosure to nonprofits or owner occupants. So uh, that's an exciting development that's going to be coming into place over the summer. Um, and I think that's one of our key strategies for making sure that these distressed homes are leveraged as part of the affordable supply rather than just sold to the highest bidder. Um, and then... Um, Two other recommendations that I think are really important um, and that the, the brief uh, highlighted on the federal side is um, expanding access to low balance mortgage loans and also supporting shared equity home ownership models. Um, so, um, Ebony, next slide. Um, at, the, at the legislative level, uh, there are a couple of recommendations that the, uh, the group advance uh, that would really help prioritize owner occupants um, or first time home buyers. Um, you know, that is increasing funding for and improving access to down payment assistance programs. Most notably, um, I think that means the, the Down Payment Toward Equity Act of 2021 that um, you know, had been uh, you know, seriously considered last year as part of the reconciliation package. We think that um, you know, the down payment is oftentimes one of the biggest barriers to first time home ownership, um, you know, and especially for, um, you know, what we, you know, for, um, you know, borrowers of color or lower wealth individuals. Um, the other legislative asks that, uh, you know, we are prioritizing, uh, the next one is the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. That is a new federal tax credit that would essentially um, subsidize the rehabilitation of affordable, uh, lower priced homes for home ownership. 
um, specifically aimed at addressing uh, what some might call the um, the appraisal gap or um, the, the gap between what it costs to renovate a house and what you can sell it for. So uh, we do think that the, the NIA um, legislation uh, is something that has bipartisan support on the Hill, and we are hopeful that uh, that package will be able to move forward uh, at some point during the Biden administration. Um, the other two bills I wanted to talk about were the Restoring Communities Left Behind Act. Uh, that is essentially... Um, calling, uh, creating at HUD a competitive grant program for um, the revitalization of, of, of lower income or, or more distressed neighborhoods. Uh, one of the things that it would do would we would pro uh, provide subsidies to, um, to operate uh, owner occupant aimed um, home rehabilitation programs. Um, and so, you know, it would be uh, it, another important tool to creating affordable inventory, affordable, affordable quali quality inventory um, as part of comprehensive community revitalization efforts. Um, and then finally, um, the last one on this list is the Stop Wall Street Looting Act. This is specifically aimed at, um, you know, taking away some of the advantages that private equity has uh, in, 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 in many markets. So not just in the home buying market, but, you know, um, including in the home buying market. And um, our other presenters today, when the uh, AFR and also MH Action are going to talk um, a little bit more in particular about private equity and some of the real dangers that they play to um, neighborhoods and communities. Um, so um, next slide. Uh, my final slide, I'll just talk about a number of state and local policies that we think um, can help prioritize owner occupants and first time home buyers. Um, you know, the first one is probably near and dear to the heart of many people on this call, you know, um, as you are the people who help um, implement these programs, but encouraging state and local governments to create owner occupied home ownership programs is one of the best things that we can do to counter, um, you know, the the dominant the corporatization of housing by um, by investors. Um, second, um, you, you know, the, we talked about uh, you know cash being king. Uh, how can we make invest uh, nonprofit purchasers or uh, owner occupant purchasers more competitive uh, in a purchase transaction? Um, we think that there needs to be um, innovative nonprofit programs that help first time buyers really be competitive. We've seen uh, some private label versions of these um, emerge over the past few years during the really competitive nature of the pandemic housing market. Uh, but we think that, um, you know, it's best when the interests of the buyer and the, um, the agent facilitating that are fully aligned and we think nonprofit models are the way to go about that. Um, you know, a couple other that I'll mention just really briefly, um, explore our local right of first refusal. So when an affordable uh, home or unit comes up for sale, um, does the, the tenant occupant or the municipality or a designated nonprofit have the right to purchase that before um, it is sold on the open market? Um, similarly, uh, state and local policies that discourage large scale investor purchases, um, encouraging sellers to sell to owner occupants, um, the brief that National Housing Resource Center put out has a couple interesting examples of um, kind of neighborhood focused um, operations that uh, bring by really that, that, that work to bring um, buyers to kind of suitable inventory that they can occupy as owner occupants and they try to facilitate those transactions. Um, and then the final one is um, just continuing to prove on, on how homes are sold. And that means uh, in large part auctions, but um, all kinds of home sale processes to ensure that first time home buyers have an equal chance to compete for these homes and, um, and access some home, home ownership. So I know I, I know I touched on a lot of questions there, uh, right, a lot of topics there. Um, what I, I guess the message that I really want to get across is um, while the surge of investor purchasers and cash purchasers in the market is uh, large, it's nothing new. Um, and in large part, I think we know what to do about it. And what we need to do is devote resources and thought leadership to programs that are going to help prioritize first-time homeowners, um, rather than um, you know really allowing um, you know corporate investors to purchase the preponderance of our housing stock. So, um, with that, I will stop, and um, I believe Andrew's going to be our next panelist. But uh, Bruce probably has an introduction. Thanks, thanks a lot, um, Dave. That was excellent, and uh, really appreciate both the presentation and your involvement in this and NCST's role. Um, so the Americans for Financial Reform is um, a large umbrella organization of um, uh, civil rights, community, um, housing, uh, consumer, uh, labor organizations. 
and um, has had a key role in Dot Frank and in um, the creation of the CFPB. Um, they've been um, uh, really an ambitious but um, very thoughtful, pra pragmatic organization. Um, and we have learned a lot from them. Um, we're deeply involved in their housing task force um, uh, working group. And um, it's been a real forum for advocates to um, do our work and amplify our message. Um, so really appreciate their role. Um, one of the things that they're deeply concerned about has been around um, uh, this uh, uh, investment in financial um, instruments that uh, really take wealth away from um, low and moderate income and working people and uh, um, make the wealthy wealthier and wealthier. Um, and um, with that lens, they've done, uh, they've put together a um, or about to put together a, or release a, um, a study on the, as it's titled here, private equity ownership of housing and rental stock. I'm really pleased that we have Andrew Park with us today from AFR uh, to talk about what they're looking at the study and certainly if there's other aspects of this issue that you want to add that that's helpful as well. So Andrew, welcome and I'll leave it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bruce, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. So as uh, building upon what uh, David had just been uh, talking about with the rise of investors uh, in, in the housing market, um, I'm going to be talking today about how uh, private equity has been one of the uh, largest forces uh, behind the disappearance of affordable housing and just kind of go into the details of how they're doing this and in what ways, just uh, so that we can all think about uh, how to coordinate uh, responses to, uh, to this problem here. Uh, and so uh, if we go to the next slide, um, just to kind of uh, give everyone a preview of a uh, report that we have coming out at the uh, end of uh, this month or potentially early, uh, early next month, we're looking at the uh, private equity industry, which uh, by way of background, uh, usually um, they will pick up uh, a lot of different capital from uh, pension funds, from insurance companies or other wealthy individuals and pull them together to, uh, to typically buy companies. But one thing that we have really noticed uh, post 2008 is that um, with a, a lot of investment opportunities uh, becoming increasingly scarce, a number of private equity firms have moved on out to focus specifically on buying single family uh, housing uh, and all for the purposes of renting them out. And so by, by way of that, you know, private equity has now become one of the uh, country's largest landlords. And so we have found that um, they're now landlords to about, you know, 1.4 million uh, families, right? So if we think about what that number actually comes out to, that's, uh, you know, that includes multifamily um, apartment units, um, manufactured homes, and then also, um, you know, many of, you know, many single family uh, rentals uh, as well. So, you know, one of the one of the figures that we also saw was that um, in in the course of these purchases, it understates how concentrated a, a lot of the purchases actually are. Because again, private equity is not going to be buying McMansions. They're not buying, you know, those type of reals. They're buying. They're focusing specifically on entry level homes, which is uh, what has been displacing a lot of uh, of buyers otherwise. And so to give some numbers behind that, uh, in areas such as Charlotte, you have institutional investors who make up as, as many as one in nine rental home owners. Uh, and we see something similar in Tampa, in Atlanta, uh, and in some cases specifically in Atlanta, you know, one in five uh, in, uh, owners of homes are actually institutional investors. And so what's even, what we found that to be even more disturbing is that, you know, this competition is not being done in a fair way. It's um, a, a lot of these uh, private equity firms are actually able to rely on both uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to also get loans and, you know, that are subsidized in order to buy many of these, um, of these properties that they have. 
And so that, that, that's another just kind of stark area of disparity that we are seeing here. Um, and so now if you go into the next slide, well, one of the big uh, consequences for this is that uh, many tenants who live in private equity or other institutionally uh, owned homes are, um, you know, are, are being treated very poorly. Uh, and a lot of that is driven by the fact that these private equity firms are focused first and foremost on generating returns for their investors and also for their uh, executives. And so there aren't really considerations about necessarily how to be a good landlord, how, how to be a good member of the community, but it just purely profit driven. And so one of the so some of the many consequences we see of this now is that um, many tenants um, in in these uh, private equity uh, owned homes will face rent hikes that are many times faster than the national average. So, um, but by last count, we see something along the lines of eight percent annually compared to uh, around five and a half percent nationally. So. Uh, and one of the reasons why is because um, many of these uh, private equity firms know that uh, tenants, once they enter into homes, they don't have the flexibility to just simply walk away. Um, oftentimes, they know understand that moving is expensive, and so they are, are readily able to uh, exercise their ability to raise rents. Um, quicker uh, than, than the average. Um, one other uh, extension of that is that they will also add a lot of fees. Um, these are not your standard fees, which you know we have a lot of issues with that as, as is, but also many other uh, fees that just get tacked on that, um, that don't really have a good explanation around them necessarily. Um, so you know, these are your administration fees, your you know, all sorts of you know, fraudulent late fees. Um, that get added on. And then, you know, to add to that as well, um, a lot of the, again, these private equity landlords aren't focused on being landlords, but rather extracting profit from their tenants. And so there have been numerous, uh, you know, cases where, um, where, where upkeep has, has not been uh, as good. And so you have uh, many different properties that don't have functioning heat in the winter, uh, you don't have sewer systems working properly, um, you have uh, pest problems, you have uh, mold, uh, and so just very basic issues that don't make uh, their properties habitable for, for tenants. Um, and on top of that, in 2020, you know, what happens is that even if you don't pay, um, private equity landlords are also not very forgiving and they're very uh, quick to evict their tenants. And so across the board, we, we see that um, not only, you know, the consequences of how a very profit driven, um, you know, landlord has has really made um, is not only a dominating uh, the, you know, the 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 stock housing stock in certain uh, areas, but they are also very, very bad landlords as well. And so if we go on to the uh, next slide. We're, uh, these are some of the uh, examples of uh, some of these uh, of the firms that are involved uh, in this uh, single family rental market. And so uh, companies like, uh, you know, Pretium Partners, which is a hedge fund, uh, Blackstone, which is one of the biggest uh, private equity firms out there. Uh, this um, is just a small sample of all the different uh, private equity buyers that are out there. Um, and so, and I saw an, a question in the uh, chat. Um, in many cases, uh, some of these private equity firms will try and use uh, shell companies um, to, in order to disguise their ownership. Um, you know, many have tried to ultimately find what shell companies you know are tied to to an ultimate owner, but. Uh, it is possible that there is an undercount, um, but again, one of the big challenges with private equity firms in this country is that there is no regulatory agency that overlooks them, and also um, there is not the amount of reporting that they are required to do similar to other financial institutions, such as banks um, and, and other types as well, where so in, in a lot of cases, it, the ownership is, you know, can be a little murky at times, which is uh, another effort that we are really pushing back on to get more transparency in both the private equity and hedge fund industry. Uh, and so if we then go into the final slide, 
I'm sorry. Okay, I guess that was the, the final slide. But just in conclusion, um, you know, as um, you know, a, a, as David had been mentioning earlier, we have been pushing for many um, regulatory and legislative solutions. Um, one of which is the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, which would fundamentally address many of these issues that you know we have been raising uh, and problems that we've been raising with the private equity industry. And so um, on top of that, we have also been looking for different ways to um, have um, private equity specifically um, make, make it more challenging for them to acquire all these homes because uh, at the current pace that they are right now, they, that ownership is continuing to grow. Uh, and so, you know, upcoming legislation there uh, as to how to address private equity specifically uh, in single family rental housing. And so with that, I will uh, conclude my remarks and Bruce, turn it back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. And um, we are, this audience, I think is very deeply concerned about the, um, um, the amount of housing stock, the starter homes, the, um, uh, the affordable home, single family houses that are uh, being uh, bought up by private equity companies and taken off of the um, home ownership marketplace and, and becoming rental and has a big impact on our work. So we will very much wanna work with you on um, whatever tools there are to uh, reverse the course of this action and and uh, the, the benefits that uh, private equity companies have that really make them um, uh, make, an un make a first time home buyer uncompetitive in the market. This is central to our work. Um, I, I know that you have a limited time and, and uh, Ellie just asked if we could um, see if there are questions that are specific to you that we should um, answer. Um, and then from there, we'll go to um, um, talk about the manufactured homes situation. So, um, Ellie, have we got some questions lined up? Thanks, Bruce. There aren't any questions, but there are a couple of comments that I thought Andrew might want to respond to. Um, private equity, for, equity firms are also buying regulated affordable rental housing whose restrictions are soon to expire. Then they convert it to market rate, displacing all the low-income residents and removing affordable housing inventory from the market. It's happening to a low-income senior complex in uh, excuse me if I'm saying this wrong, uh, to guard Oregon. Any, any response to that or should I go right to the next one, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no doubt that, um, again, um, private equity is specifically targeting, um, you know, low income and affordable housing. Um, again, part of the reason why too is that they are also aware of the fact that this, you know, that that typically the home the the renters there may may have less, you know, resources, um, you know, against them, uh, which is you know starkly very evil, right? It, it, it's 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 terrible. Um, but this is also part of the reason why we see um, that focus is because um, less recourse, but also. Um, just, I, I think the ability to raise rents faster um, on, on a lot of affordable housing. So um, it's, it, it's, you know, and, and the conversion only, you know, is, is another form of that. So, you know, it, it's something that, you know, it, we're certainly aware of and, you know, continue to think about how to, how to address, you know, that specific problem. Okay. Uh, what states are doing the most to address this issue? You know, I'll have to think about um, which, which states, I, I don't have any off the, the top of my head, unfortunately. I, I do know that because this is a nationwide problem, there is thought about a federal solution because, um, you know, ultimately all, all 50 states um, will, you know, are, are impacted in some way by, by um, private equity, you know, e ownership, even though a lot of it may be focused in, you know, a handful of uh, Sunbelt states that I that I just mentioned earlier, but um, really this is a federal problem. I can't speak necessarily to um, the individual state level. Well, I will, I will say that if folks see in the chat, I posted a copy of the, the brief that uh, David mentioned uh, when he was speaking. And within that brief, there are actually uh, some state level programs, the state level legislation, if, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, that uh, that you can see in there. There's some 
uh, some things that have been done in Denver, some things that have been done in California, in New York State. Um, so you can see a couple of examples there. Not that that says that they're doing the most, but it's just a couple uh, uh, examples that we that we put into that brief. Um, why are they focusing on lower priced first beginner homes to invest in? Yeah, so I, I think as I was mentioning before, um, it's, it's unfortunately where um, private equity can raise rents the fastest. Um, and I, I believe there, there, there's been research that they've done on their end where they believe that the, the, the tenants are more, more likely to stay uh, and just put up with, the, uh, with, with those price increases. Um, it's, you know, I, I think there, this is private equity exercising its power in, in very negative and bad ways. And, and this is just one of the, the many ways where by, by you know, owning many of the, uh, you know, many concentrated ownership of in, in, uh, in certain neighborhoods, it's like, where are you going to go? Are you going to go, is someone, go, is a tenant going to go to another property that's owned by private equity, right? I mean, if we're talking about one in, you know, one in five homes uh, that are that are owned by private equity, it's, you know, unfortunately, the renters in those markets just do not have good choices. Um, and, and that's, you know, that that's also a very big problem um, that just with, with, with the concentration of private equity purchases, um, just, just taking the power away from, from renters here. It's been reported that some of these organizations currently have 30 billion in cash to purchase more homes. What impact will this have if policy is not passed as soon as possible? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately those, those numbers that, um, that, that, we, that I shared to you at the beginning of uh, my presentation, um, you know, there, there's money ready to go um, and, you know, we are, you know, we continue to see private equity actively buying tens of thousands of homes, uh, also uh, manufactured uh, housing. We have, you know, Black, uh, Blackstone who had recently done a, uh, done, a, you know, yet another purchase. Um, and, you know, there's really no, um, no stopping them right now until we have legislation uh, or other, you know, pri other types of, you uh, you know, things to, to fundamentally stop uh, either private equity or uh, to stop them from getting involved in housing. Um, that, that, you know, that those figures are certainly, you know, right. And, um, you know, we, we are going to, they, they're ready to be deployed, unfortunately. And so we, we need to be ready to, you know, to, to counter, um, you know, what, what are inevitably just going to be more purchases. Great. Thanks, those were the questions that were specific to you, Andrew, so far. There may be more that come up, so um, I know you can stay until 2.30, and if there are more questions that come up, we'll, we'll try to get them to you before you have to leave. Thank you. Thanks, and um, very helpful. The one thing I would add, too, is that in the home buyer market, in the single family purchasing market, um, the mechanism that they have is they have these algorithms that scrape um, multiple listing service listings. And as soon as something is posted, they can within several minutes figure out what the cost of the property is, make a, an estimate of what the value would be if they flipped it to rental and um, jacked up the rents. And that gives them a range of what's affordable. They, I'm sure assume that they'll put some, a coat of paint on some, some repairs but it's um, probably not substantial. And then that, um, uh, and then they make a low ball offer and, um, um, or maybe just uh, offer what the list price is depending on the marketplace. Um, and they can also then, um, if somebody does come in and make an offer, they can um, uh, immediately um, up that offer and um, uh, match it and exceed it. And really um, uh, kind of, go quite aggressively, it's, it's you're running against a machine and home buyers are obviously take time to think things through and learn about what's happening and uh, um, they're uh, competing basically against the machine and and their guess on what, what happens. And that adds one more layer of um, unfairness to the process. Okay, so, um, I'm really pleased that we've got um, uh, uh, Sandra Lees from um, uh, MH Action um, 
similar kind of processes happening with manufactured home parks. Um, Sandra's from um, the um, is as a community leader and resident of one of these parks in the Hudson Valley area. Um, Sandra, welcome, and uh, please tell us what you've experienced. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, if I sound terrified, I'm in. I'm not used to public speaking anymore. Um, and to, to correct you, I reside in Ridgeview Mobile Home Park, and it's in upstate New York, um, near the Buffalo, Niagara Falls area. Um, I grew up in Western New York, uh, but by the late 70s, my family had relocated to Florida piece by piece, so uh, I finally decided to join them and ended up working for a county agency in Florida. And when I got, when I got close to retirement, I really wanted to move back up into this area. My, my brother had moved back up here. He was the, pretty much the last remaining family member I had, and I wanted to be near family. So I did. I did a reverse retiree thing and it moved from Florida back to Western New York. When I was deciding where I would live, I took into consideration, obviously, my retirement income that I would have. And in my case, I obviously would have Social Security income, and I had a, a nice state reti retirement income as well. Um, the fact that I lived in loan, uh, take, I also took that into consideration. And after several trips back and forth, to New York to look at my options, I made the decision to purchase a new double wide manufactured home and to reside in a mobile home park. The park I chose was a relatively small, uh, 120 plus homes that was family owned and operated. Um, the son of the couple who built the park in the late 50s was on site management along with a maintenance man and a couple of part time staff in the summertime. So pretty much whatever needed to be done in the park was handled very quickly and very well. Uh, but just before I did, I moved in, which was in the spring of 2019, um, the son informed me that he had sold the park to a company called SCI out of Florida. Things went along for that next year very fairly smoothly. We still had on-site management. Um, we still, everything was taken care of. Well, then in December of 2021, the, we got notice that the park had again been sold to a company out of, uh, out of New York State. Um, and they had passed out uh, notices to all the residents with uh, new leases that we needed to take a look at and, and, a, and a rent increase that they were, in, they were, in, they were in, uh, requesting. Um, that's when I jumped into action along with Sharon Ruth, another resident there, um, and we, she passed out notices to all of us stating that we needed to form a tenants association uh, to get a handle on this. We did. Um, in the spring of that year, we formed an association. Sharon was voted president and I was elected vice president. In our investigation of the owners, we quickly found out that the new owners were the owner of multiple parks in the state and were continually buying up more parks using investors' money to do so. We also very quickly found out that although the new owners were quick to promise that issues in the park would be fixed, they were very good at promises and very bad at actually fulfilling those promises. Um, we have sewer issues in this park. We have uh, drainage issues. We have dying tree issues. Um, we had major issues with snow plowing this winter uh, to the point where uh, at one point they were only plowing one lane throughout the park. And a one of the residents' young daughter um, went into respiratory arrest and the, the, the ambulance had a really difficult time getting to the house. Uh, thankfully that they did and, and she, she was taken to the hospital. Um, it got to the point in the fall of 2021 that we knew we needed help. So um, we contacted a local attorney who had handled these type issues before. Sharon and I met with him, went through the issues that we were having and he agreed to take on the case if we could raise the money. 
So we had him come to a, a meeting of all the association members, and he spoke to them and told them what our rights were and reassured them what our rights were, and Sharon and I had already tried to fill them in, um, and and agreed that we, we definitely had a case of habitability issues in this park. So we actually got all of the members to chip in $100 each, and we managed the, to get together $7,100 as a retainer for the attorney. That was in November of last year. Um, since then, not a lot has changed. Uh, the park owners have basically stonewalled. Um, they have not fixed anything that they, uh, that they have promised to fix all along. Our attorney is finally figuring that out. We are now going on a second month, um, actually third month. We did a, a we, we withheld rent in the month of March. Um, by the third week, uh, the owners were screaming for their rent money and agreed to meet with us. Promised the moon again, that didn't come forward. Um, and we went back on withholding rent in the month of May and we will continue on until we get in writing that they will fix the issues in the park um, and the deadline that they will be fixed by. Um, it, it's, a, it's a long road to hoe. I personally, uh, the Saturday right before Easter, Easter Saturday, um, I had my neighbor across the street contact me to tell me that I had something bubbling up in the back of my, of my lot. Uh, it was sewer. I uh, found out that all the sewer lines terminate in my backyard. So there was obviously a backup somewhere, and it was and it was terminating and, and bubbling out in my backyard. Come to find out after it was fixed that the sewer backup was caused because the park owner had failed to pay multiple months of electrical bills. So National Grid had turned off the electric power to the pump house and lift station. We were not happy. Um, so, and, and, and that's where we stand at this point. Um, we, they have the list of our demands from our attorney. They have the deadlines that we're demanding and we have yet to get anything back from them with, yes, they will fix this. And yes, it will be fixed by this point in time. Um, this company just recently finalized a 69 million dollar purchase of 54 mobile home parks compromising i think it's like 1200 pads along with a mobile home manufacturing company um used by the way that was that was funded with um uh fannie mae loan um one on their website uh, they have a a page to geared toward investors and they talk about why you should invest in mobile home parks. And one of their number one reasons is that there's low maintenance costs. Yeah, there's low maintenance costs because they don't do any maintenance. Um, well, another issue we recently had is one of the homes in the park is continually flooded because of a drainage issue in the park. Um, the last time it flooded, I personally called 911 because the all the water was under their mobile home, causing the electrical connection connection to their meter to start sparking. Um, when they, when the park owner, park manager, who is not on site, um, contacted the owners, they informed the owners that they would have to fix it at their expense. Our, our, the associations come back to the owners was no, it's or to the park owner or to the the homeowner was no, it is not. It's the parks because they caused the issue of the of the flooding. It, this is our constant battle. Um, uh, this is not what I planned on doing in my retirement years. Um, I had vowed I would never be on another association again, and here I am. But um, both both Sharon and I, the president and I, have vowed that we will stay until this is solved. Um, this is where I planned on spending the rest of my life. This is where I wanted to be. Um, and and God bless it. I will stay here and they will fix this. 
Um, and um, MH Action has been a great help to us. They have we have actually connected with a lot of uh, the same owner parks, um, Akron Park being one of the other ones. Um, and and we're kind of encouraging each other. I think we're kind of in the forefront. We're the only one that we know of that has actually gone on a withholding rent strike, as it, as I want to put it. It's not necessarily a strike, but we're, we are withholding rent under habitability issues in the state of New York. Um, and we're encouraging those other parks to do the same. They are pretty much every park that we have talked to that is owned by the same company is in the same boat we are. They are just not fixed. Um, in fact, just before we hired the attorney, we met with the property manager and another employee um, in my home to discuss what was going on and what, what the, the uh, Association was talking about doing an hiring attorney, and I wish I had had my my recorder on my phone on at the time because they sat right there and blatantly looked at Sharon and I and said, "If you hire an attorney, you'll never get anything you want." So that's what we're dealing with with private equity. Um, something's got to be done to fix it. Um, it really needs to. We need help. That's my story. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much for the good work you're doing and MH Action is doing. Um, we're interested in supporting on the policy side. Um, I mean, it's manufactured housing is, is an affordable housing option and um, the presence of these private equity companies has been deeply problematic. So um, we wanna encourage you to keep up the fight. I'm sure you will um, and mm -hmm. we appreciate all you're doing. Um, let me pivot here and see if there are questions for any of our um, presenters. Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the one of the people asked uh, any suggestions about what we can do locally. And I, I just want to point out that Sandra just talked about some of the things that can be done locally, particularly um, in manufactured home parks and in communities. Um, that that kind of organizing and and being um, you know paying a lot of attention to what's going on and I just want to point out to Sandra I don't know if you're seeing it in the chat but you're getting a lot of congratulatory comments and tenant organizing for the win and and so on so um, awesome. um, and and uh, you know one person said sorry you have to go through this no one should have to go through it. Um, so anyway, uh, about the question about anything that can that can be done locally, uh, David or Andrew, any suggestions or thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I happen to believe that a lot can be done locally. Obviously, it doesn't change things across the country, but it can really change the trajectory of in a community. I think, um, you know, this the sort of work that uh, you know Sandra is taking on is 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 absolutely critical. You know, I also think. As I, you know, as I alluded to, we we do have strong tools to try to prevent, um, you know, to try to get these homes into the hands of the right owners. I actually don't know. Manufactured housing communities are are a complicated thing, and I know that there has been success in particular states uh, creating kind of like resident-owned cooperatives. That um, you know, that seems to me like a partial solution. Um, and uh, you know, I think honestly, uh, having a strong you know CDC or community action. Um, agency um, is 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 one of the best ways. It's one of the best assets you can have on your side if you're dealing with this problem. And um, I, just echoing um, what David just said, I think just at the local level, I, I think just being able to push back um, collectively, you know. So yes, residential cooperatives I think are a very important uh, element of that because. Um, just by, you know, I think when private equity firms run into more and more uh, just resistance at the local level, eventually um, it, it'll just be, you know, the goal is, I think it'll be just not worth their while to get involved in a lot of these different uh, areas. And so I think just locally, just, you know, through everyone's work combined, um, you know, the collective pushback can make it a lot more difficult for the industry to continue to come in. So I would just really echo you know, what David was saying with the, the community, uh, you know, the cooperatives and just, you know, just everyone working together, just wherever, wherever you live, just it all collectively um, makes the fight, um, makes it just a lot challenging for private equity. I agree. 
Great, thank you. Um, so this is um, a question from, um, from somebody who is kind of new to the industry. How did we get here? Did we start seeing this during the housing bubble? Um, so yeah, so definitely. I mean, so there, you know, there have always been investors in the housing market, um, of course. Uh, but you know, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, what we saw was that, um, you, you know, you know, especially you know, one of the people were innovating on their business model essentially to take advantage of the the low home prices and the tight mortgage access to credit and rising rents across the country. Um, and one of the more significant things is the creation of an industry that um, specializes in scattered site single family rental. Um, so before uh, the financial crisis, there was not, you know, these large companies were not, uh, you know, buying pockets of scattered site homes, they would buy apartment buildings, uh, they would buy, you know, community manufactured housing communities, although, uh, you know, they weren't perhaps as aggressive as we've seen the industry been recently in terms of jacking up rents and, and trying to be really extractive there. Um, but what, you know, one of the things that really changed uh, was um, these companies that, that now uh, will go up and buy single family homes all across the metro area. Uh, before that was really seen as kind of an insurmountable logistical and maintenance challenge. Um, and now there are a whole bunch of new technologies and new practices uh, that make that a more efficient model for um, for these companies. Um, and I'm sure Andrew has lots of other idea, uh, thoughts about kind of what's changed. Um, sorry to call on you, Andrew. No, um, and I think just to, to build on that, um, I think right after the, uh, the, the financial crisis, you saw uh, for the first time, um, a lot of these uh, institutions uh, choose, you know, the way that they would get in was to actually uh, buy up at foreclosure auctions tens of thousands of homes. And so that's that's kind of how we, you know, as, as David was saying before, this was a much more scattered process, but now we we have an actual, you know, machine and a natural process in place where they could now, you know, buy up many of these homes now in mass and then convert them because of that, you know, that scale that they suddenly had made it made many um it made it worthwhile for many institutional investors to get involved in this way uh add on top of that many of them had been able to raise money um in in the years in 2010 2011 from a lot of these uh pension funds and um other in other investors in the private equity firms that had actually lost a lot of money and so they were looking for ways to recoup their losses and so this, you know, both those forces combined really kind of helped um, really push this market into becoming what it is today. Um, you know, and I think that's significant change, right? Like these dynamics have existed pre-2008. It's just now it just has become a lot bigger. And then there's actually ways for, for, for money, for capital to actually flow into, you know, a process way to actually buy a lot of these single family homes. Uh, well, right along those same lines, so somebody is asking, um, is this related potentially at all to COVID since in their area, they're saying that the single unit price increased, particularly since 2020? Um, the, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, the answer is both, both yes and no. So I think we have a supply shortage in this country that's been building really since we've been underbuilding since the Great Recession started. Um, you know, that being said, I think it's undoubtable that COVID has taken the situation in our single family um, housing markets and just taken it to a new extreme. So less inventory available for sale, more people who want to buy it. I think we're seeing increased demand both from owner occupants and from institutional investors. Um, and it just happens that they're competing in a market that isn't um, a level playing field. And so uh, we have the consequences that we that we see today. And just echoing the uh, one of the findings from our report, we found that last year about one, almost nearly a quarter of, of homes were purchased by some sort of institutional investor. So, um, you know, clearly, you know, I think there a lot of the owner occupants have, you know, been more active in the uh, the the real estate market as well. But you know, we, we I think combined with the institutional side and just that amount of buying too in a market where. You know, we're not creating a housing stock anywhere close to where we need to be. It's just, I, I think th those are both fueling what we're seeing right now. And what do you both think of Jeff Bezos' new company model, Arrived Homes? 
I admit I don't really know. Um, I hadn't heard of arrived homes before, so I'll have to do some research. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to have to uh, defer to someone else too. I, I'm not as familiar with their uh, business model. I will keep my opinion to myself about Jeff Bezos in general. Okay, that seems to be uh, all of the, oh wait, one more thing. Uh, for people living in condo projects with HOAs, is it legal to pass a rule that new buyers must occupy a unit for at least two years after purchase? This might hold off institutional investors. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, what I would say is, I, you know, I have heard of HOA restrictions about the percentage of uh, units that can be leased. Um, and so, uh, so I do know that people do, um, you know, set maximums on those sorts of things. So um, I, think, I think you ask a good question. Okay. Um, and, um, and one of our participants was kind enough to post a link to arrived homes in the, in the chat box. So if anybody wants to check it out, it's there. And that is the end of our questions. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for um, uh, what's a valuable and um, sometimes troubling conversation here about um, uh, private equity and its role in housing America. Um, we're going to uh, move on very quickly. Um, just a reminder that uh, please join NHRC and renew. Um, the, um, uh, we will have a um, I think uh, uh, if we, we continue to do good work and we want you to be involved as much as we can. Um, and we really count on um, membership as being a key piece to our, uh, our ability to um, uh, be independent and lobby. Um, you know, we have discounts for credit reports, quite valuable and the savvy program. Um, we also do send out um, very interesting funding opportunities that may be out of the side of the mainstream of what you normally see. And um, we send those out occasionally as well um, and do want to make sure we um, um, engage members as much as we can in the programs that we do. So please, you know, take advantage of that, but um, um, join and, and renew, We've, um, we really need the support. Uh, we don't have a schedule for the next meeting coming up, but we will, um, uh, uh, just to keep an eye out on our leaders in housing counseling list. And somebody just asked, uh, Marsha asked, just asked if, um, uh, if the recording will be posted and uh, pretty much um, uh, our recordings get posted by tomorrow afternoon, by Friday afternoon, um, certainly by Monday, and they'll be on, the, um, on our website and just go to the webinars page and um, it'll be the top one on the list because they're done in reverse chronological order. Okay, well, thanks everybody for a good session. Um, we will talk to you soon.